I was the guy who was going for saying yes to everything, major FOMO. I wanted the, the best career, the best life, the best everything. I think that there's an inner side to entrepreneurship that's not as well covered or as well understood. I started out actually right out of uni having a really solid, rigid plan actually, and it went out the window really quickly with the 2008 crisis. By the way, I've never had a single promotion in my life, never been a great employee, and that's because I'm really struggling to just draw within the lines. I got a, um, a recent diagnosis as an adult for ADHD and a lot of things clicked for me. Talking to yourself as being a loser is extremely, extremely damaging because you're not. Basically, failure is just the successful discovery of what didn't work. If you remove the emotional impact of failing, I think a failed founder for me is way more employable than someone who's, who's brought up at McKinsey. I was living in a constant state of anxiety. And as a founder, also like nothing works, right? So Shopify picked you guys up in mid 2018. What was that moment like? I guess even today I have sort of mixed feelings. I feel like I never, never completely settled. What does your day look like these days? Is in like, what do you do? Uh, I mean, is, obviously you can see a couple of things on your LinkedIn profile, but like, what do you, what do you fill your day with? Yeah, good question. Well, first, really happy to share. Uh, in terms of making it, I can't tell you I have a strong sense of having made it. And I'd love to maybe explore even what making it means uh, if we get the chance today. As for my days these days, I would say um, they're, um, they're quite eclectic. So I'm writing a book. I spend a couple hours every morning actually uh, revising a draft, a book called The Tao of Founders, which is meant to be um, a way to help founders uh, balance out the extremes of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's an inner side to entrepreneurship that's not as well covered or as well understood. And personally, I ended up writing a bunch of different ideas and principles over time that served me well. So I figured, hey, why not just share them? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I'm doing. And otherwise, I've been prototyping quite a bit. Uh, I'm currently sort of involved, uh, like my domain is e-commerce and software. So pretty much everything I, I build is in that, that space. Um, so ChatGPT released some new, um, some new tools this week. So I've been uh, playing around with them and see, uh, yeah, I have a couple uh, product ideas. Mm -hmm. So usually I'll spend uh, my afternoons playing around, trying to build stuff, uh, talk to potential users. And uh, I put that in the realm of a product studio, let's say, um, that, that I, I guess that's kind of my next phase, um, uh, in, uh, at least how I see the next phase of my, my career, uh, just qu quite experimenting all the time and mm -hmm. doing a pure zero to one type of work, okay. which is really what I love doing. When you say the next phase in your career, do you, would you say you'd have, you have a plan for your career as in, is there at least in theory, is it like, here's what mm -hmm. the next 20 years are going to look like? Uh, well, yes and no. I would say that plans are essential, but what do I say? Like planning is essential, but plans are useless. And I started out actually right out of uni having a really solid, rigid plan actually. And it went out the window really quickly with the 2008 crisis. So mm -hmm. ever since I've been um, very aware of the value of flexibility. So I think for me, my plan is having a long-term vision for what's unique about me and how I want to contribute, say, to others, and also my values and more like day-to-day, -day, how do I want to behave? And so I have like a very kind of like working backwards approach, but also have sort of like day-to-day values-driven um, kind of uh, framework. And mm -hmm. then um, the plan, well, I guess there's no plan in between. So I just kind of twist and turn depending on on how things evolve. And, and I prefer to keep it pretty, pretty light. Yeah. How do you keep stock um, of, of where you are or that's in, that you're still within that framework that you just mentioned? Well, that's a really good question. Actually, I keep revising that framework. It's, it's so, I think if, um, if I had to tell myself um, something 10, 15 years um, ago, obviously, you know, the MBA type is very ambitious, kind of driven person, smart, curious, um, all of that. 
I think that um, the, 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 the figuring out what you really want and what is the right thing for you is, is really, really important. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's a one and done kind of thing. So call it self-actualization, but I'm having this ongoing conversation with myself and sort of refining my, my vision and my plan. But on the whole, yes, yeah, since it's based on my values and what I enjoy doing, I definitely try to approach everything from a long-term perspective um, and kind of try to do things I would only do for the rest of my career. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and so, um, so yeah, it's sort of like, again, I want to be dynamic. I want to have a clear sense of where I'm going. I think generally I've always sort of strived to have that, but also, um, there are times when I'm less sure. And to be honest, um, I built a company after Amazon, I ended up, uh, kind of working at the company that acquired us, the whole team. And I was very, very focused. I didn't really ask myself too much. What do I want out of life? I was just like, go, go, go. And the last year and a half or two years have been more exploring and getting ready, like not really having a big plan, but more doing little things and, and sort of getting exposed as opposed to consolidating, you know? So I think there it's normal for anyone in their careers to have a, like a spectrum of exploring and Mm -hmm. exploiting your assets. Right. So I think right now I'm clearly more in the explore phase, but these are seasons, right? So um, I think eventually I can see how um, I'll probably just be more exploiting or like really focusing on one main thing. Um, This phase being different than the, the phase that you just mentioned in terms of Uh, and we're going to talk about it in a second in more detail mm-hmm. as in coming up with return magic just after Amazon and then uh, and, uh, Spotify, Spotify, what am I saying? Shopify picking it up. <laughs> Spotify, okay. that's another Every, product altogether. Everyone says this. It's, it's the, kind of like an inside joke in, inside of Shopify because we get that all the time. So let, let's uh That's let's a different episode. <laughs> what, 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 you, what you're doing for, for Spotify. Now I'm not saying you're actually doing something for Spotify. But so this being a different phase now, would you say that's kind of... Uh, evolutionary as in it made sense for it to be like that now coming out of the 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 um the the hard work and as you said no asking questions type of thing uh go 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 phase with with return magic and then uh shopify Mm -hmm. um or like is that is that by design like you know is it because obviously to some extent it's almost And at the hands, I use the term evolutionary, as in, have you evolved into this? Was it outside circumstances? Like, what leaves you now be more in an, in this phase than than you were the years prior? Yeah, that's a well, that's a really deep question. Honestly, there's a few things that come to mind. Um, I guess, like going back to, like, I guess, obviously, we worked at Amazon at at the same time. So if you take a snapshot, mm. maybe for you, that's where the story starts. But for me, the story starts 20 years before. And, uh, and I've sort of wow. always want, wanted to be a founder in a way. I just ended up at Amazon because I had student debts. And, and I, but the plan, I was always in the back of my mind going to start something. Um, anyways, that's kind of besides the point. But in terms of like... Um, Yeah, there's been, I would say, a, a massive change from um, from the time that uh, uh, we exited and I joined Shopify. So there's a couple of things that happened. Maybe it's me, but I felt like I wanted to prove something to myself when I was in my 20s, for sure. Mm-hmm. And I was I was very sort of, uh, I was the guy who was going for saying yes to everything, major FOMO. I had, I wanted it all, you know, I wanted... I wanted uh, the best career, the best life, the best everything. And honestly, um, I think after a while, I got quite tired of just chasing everything all the time. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think there's that. And then after after a while, you're also like, okay, uh, like I'm 10, 15 years into my (laughs) career. So you kind of, I think I had the time to then put my backpack down, if you like, look behind and, and take a look at the progress I've done and how things have been going. So I think there's that. There's the other side of me, which has always been, I've, I, by the way, I've never had a single promotion in my life, never been a great employee. And that's because I'm really struggling to just draw within the lines. Um, mm-hmm. Let's, let's put it this way. So 
Uh, I don't see that. Like, I'm not proud of it. It's really just like who I am. I got a, um, a recent diagnosis as an adult for ADHD and a lot of things clicked for me. So, um, so all this to say that I need to try to do things in a different way. When I think about building a startup for the next phase, I'm much more um, conscious of, you know, I've, I was the business guy. I was the business founder. Uh, my co-founder was the, the CTO. He was doing the code. Mm -hmm. um, and I figured if I'm serious about, because I love building products, I really do. Um, I see myself more as a product manager now than a, an actual business person, although my background is, is an accountant. Um, hmm. but I figured if I'm going to climb the mountain, I want to do it in a different way. So I need to try like a, something that's completely lateral, not just an increment on trying to just get better at what I'm currently doing. So I tend to try to every five years or so, I think naturally sort of reinvent essentially how I'm, I'm approaching things. So that's, that's, that's how I've always been like this. So I think that's also like a big component of me needed to explore because I felt like, I couldn't really fully reconcile um, the person I was up to a point and, and that person, like, it's almost like a, a, a snake shedding their skin in a way I felt mm. like it took, and I'm still honestly trying to figure out uh, how I want to approach things, what drives me and, um, and such. So, yeah, I think, I don't know if I answered your, your question directly, but these are things that I think for me have always been important. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, like, I think entrepreneurship is very much like, uh, I think surfing is a good analogy, but you also have to uh, look at the waves, look at currents, you have to sort of, there's a big timing component. So being at the right place at the right time is the main skill of a good entrepreneur, in my opinion. And it's, it's very open ended as a skill. Mm -hmm. It's not like one thing, it's more like just generally, um, how do you position yourself to be in a, in a position of luck. So all of that also forces me to sort of be quite uh, willing to kind of do a U-turn on, on a dime, mm -hmm. if you like, to, to be uh, able to seize anything that, that comes up as, as I see it. Did you build um, companies or products before your, before your MBA? I did, yeah, I did. None of them were uh, fantastic, like a fantastic success. Uh, actually, most of them were really crappy, I'll be honest. But the first, uh, for me, the story really started when I was 15. I, um, my first startup was uh, actually a band. So I was, um, I was in a punk rock band uh -huh. and uh, I loved it. And I loved selling tickets. I had a show at my high school on radio and I was plugging the crap out of our band. And then I realized basically from there that this is it. Like for me, I think the feeling I've always been seeking in my career is the one of creative uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. So essentially what I mean by that is same as when you play in a band, you're, all of you play different instruments. Uh, you're creating something together. And when there's a magic that, that operates, you really kind of see it as special. And I think maybe that's why I've been really into startups because I feel like it's the same sort of energy you can find. And once I think you, you, you have it, you want to really keep it. But yeah, I think like that experience as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. uh, we ended up dropping out of school for a year, trying to make it big. Obviously that didn't happen. <laughs> Although our drummer did end up like a professional drummer. So I guess he made it, he kept going. As for uh, the rest, well, we obviously went to school I guess we pursued a more regular path and yeah, most of my twenties, I was just asking myself, uh, what should I do? I'm not sure what to focus on. What am I good at? So I had like, it took me a while to really find my, my full, uh, kind of my full, uh, self in a way and, and, uh, what, what I need from my career. So had a bunch of false starts, a bunch of bad ideas that didn't go anywhere. Uh, I mean, I don't want to go into this cause could take up the whole hour but yeah most of the stuff that's the beauty though of entrepreneurship when you fail you fail in obscurity no one knows about it new, no one cares the only thing that 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 is hurt is your ego if you let it but right. otherwise the successes are what you're remembered for right so i think that's that's really important there's a there's sort of like a asymmetry in that sense that um that is really important to remember even when things are not turning out the way you wanted to
And I wonder, um, with, with like the statement that you just made, uh, you fail in obscurity. That's a good one. Um, whether that's a mistake, right? And it's 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 painful for the one or, or the, the the those folks who have to go through it. <clears throat> and I say that because, like, my twenties didn't look or feel much different from what you just outlined. In terms of doing a lot of things and uh, and but at the same time not really knowing what I'm doing but I have an inkling of something the way it should be and I mean yeah. I, I kind of get like, go start going down that lane and then it kind of turning into something but not really it's like uh, it's like you're like it, it's it, it's 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 enough not to die but it's not enough to actually keep keep going with it type of thing and I coined mm -hmm. this. Uh, for a long time, I coined this my loser years, because I like <laughs> I look at those years and I'm like, uh, like I I I felt like a loser, right? And but uh, this actually took until I want to say uh, late 2019 when I I was sitting in a plane. I was like, how do I wrap my head around this time in my life where seemingly nothing came out of it? And I started jotting it down and actually drawing it out on an iPad literally as a, as a timeline and what did I do? And then I went into what are the skills that I picked up along the way or what are the things I got out of this? Aside from whether those would were financially lucrative, for example, how the world measures mm -hmm. success in many ways. And I, and I realized I picked up so many things along the way throughout those years. And yes, I, I could have been more effective or efficient or whatever, I, like whatever you want to use there um, and, and be more systematic But in the end, like it gave me a bag full of uh, skills, of tools, of experiences that otherwise I wouldn't have. And also knowing what it feels like, uh, like having to retreat and having to pivot and and still like, you keep on going. Right. So at this point, if you ask me as in how do you reflect on those years, I wouldn't actually call them loser years anymore. I would call them, you know, maybe a bit maybe not even dazed and confused, but just crazed and confused because you're, you're crazy thinking that you can, in many instances, in my case, do it on your own, which clearly didn't work in, in many instances there. But um, I, did, I don't consider them a waste. And uh, like w kind of, um, and not to go too long-winded because this interview is not about me, um, but do, uh, like the way we're being conditioned by society is that we'll focus on the successes and the quick wins and you know how you hack your yeah. way to success completely ignoring the the path that it takes to get there right everybody yeah. thinks that 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 big company or the big buyout or the big exit is an overnight success because they didn't hear as you, that's the obscurity that they didn't hear of beforehand as opposed to you actually have to go what i've come to know as this hero journey where all of a sudden you hit, hit rock bottom in so many instances And you emerge yeah. from it so much better equipped and so much, I want to say, more mature than you would have been otherwise. And without yeah. you hitting rock bottom, you would have never gotten to be that better version of yourself, right? Totally, <clears throat> totally. You mentioned something a little bit earlier around uh, like the sense can of... I, can I just interrupt yeah, you yeah. before we move on? Because I think what you just mentioned was super interesting. Uh, and I know you don't want to talk... It's not about you, but also... Um, what you touch on is for me directly related to the definition of making it. Um, so first off, I'm really glad you reframed your approach at, uh, or your thinking, your self-talk. Uh, I think that talking to yourself as being a loser is extremely, extremely damaging because you're not. You, if you look at um, astronauts, like if you try to go to the moon mm. and you fail, because you're not like, no one's going to blame you for it. No one's going to be like, this guy's a loser. And I think that um, the very fact that you're giving it a try and you're asking honest questions and you're trying honest kind of actions towards uh, actuali actuali actualizing your vision in itself mm -hmm. is, is making it to me. That is the, the process you're on. Uh, secondly, I think, especially MBAs, and I was part of that, I think, um, you know, we, I was always quite good at school. I was, I applied myself very much and I think it, it screwed me actually and up to like, it helped me and then it, it didn't help me. Mm -hmm. It actually hindered me because 
I, my tolerance for mistakes went way down. I felt like if I wasn't getting an A at everything, I would, I was, I, I wasn't cutting it. I was a loser, but that's not how life works. I remember Toby at Shopify just drilling into everyone. Like basically failure is just the successful discovery of what didn't work. Mm. So yeah. if you remove the emotional impact mm -hmm. of failing, then it's all good, you know, and you should be comfortable with it. But most people aren't. And most people don't even get out of their comfort zones to begin with. So I think for me, that's really kind of the core blocks, the core building blocks of making it. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyways, very interesting. I think you have to be also very careful at how you talk to yourself in those times, because the reality is success, yeah. as you want to like define it from an external perspective, is not a linear process. Like nothing is really in, in, in biology or like in the natural world, it's exponential. So like you have this rough kind of stretch of basically trying all these things, not knowing what works, what doesn't for years. And then eventually it's a bit like a Rubik cube. You just do one more variation and then click mm -hmm. everything sort of. So I think that's, um, but if humans are not wired like this. And if you look again at nature, you'll see that failure is everywhere. Like literally animals don't uh, kick themselves if, they, if a lion doesn't catch the gazelle or whatever. They're not like, oh man, I'm such a loser. No, they just get on with their day and they keep trying, you know? So yeah. I think like in a way um, you can find all these examples that remind us that even though we don't like to think of, uh, of that, that failure is part of the course, it's part of nature and and it's it's something to use and not to be um, blocked by. Anyways, like now, little parenthesis, feel, feel free to cut it. But for me, I think this is a really key thing, <clears throat> how you approach all of this. And even what you said, actually, interestingly, uh, what you said um, kind of at the beginning of your, uh, um, th this paragraph of yours just now is um, the, the example of the rocket, right? And so uh, recently I heard this example that rockets uh, or spaceship, whatever you want to call it, actually uh, fail fail their way forward. So a, the first rocket failed itself to the moon because mm -hmm. as a rocket starts off on a specific, it is programmed on a specific trajectory and then it, it and the point of the whole program of, the, of an autopilot even for an airplane is that something veers it off its uh, trajectory, right? And it needs to adjust. So it's constantly not on the ideal path to actually get to its destination, in this case, the moon, for example, or whatever. Um, so mm -hmm. it needs to constantly, uh, the program needs to constantly readjust itself. And in another way of putting that is it is actually it's constantly failing because it needs readjusting. Yeah. It, it's never at the point where it's like, well, yeah, now it's right. Now we can just, you know, well, let's wait two and a half days until we're there, or whatever, it, how, how long it would take. Um, that's great. So that was that was interesting of yours to, 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 as you mentioned that. Um, a, a bit earlier, you also mentioned around uh, in your twenties, like a sense of, or even earlier, I suppose, a sense of FOMO, right? As in, you want you want to be a part of that, or you want that in your life. I guess as you as you witness witness it elsewhere, um, which is one motivation to get into something. But I guess what counteracts that is. As in, do you actually have, in terms of confidence, do you have what it takes to go there? Because you can have FOMO and complain about it, or you can have FOMO mm -hmm. and say, I'm going to do something about it. And you, especially if it's something you haven't done before, you kind of jump into that. Like, um, yeah. like I guess if you had categories of how you would describe that from early on and even then... Um, during during your time at Amazon, at at which point at some stage you yeah. made the decision to to go return ma to go full time with Return mm -hmm. Magic, like what gave you the confidence to jump into that? Especially like taking a year off from school, right? As as rudimentary and as as frameworky as school is, as in who takes a year mm -hmm. off from school to to seek out success with their band? So what gave you the confidence at, in each one of those stages? Yeah, I'll start by saying I'm not the kind of guy who's naturally super confident. So in a way, it's uh, I think it's maybe a skill I've acquired. But also for me, it was uh, there's a part of necessity. So um, 
I think I mentioned I was never the best employee. So for me to go into um, basically the first leg of my career, I was just trying to be smart. You know, I did investment banking. I did the jobs. I didn't take many risks. I just kind of went on the path that seemed like the, the, the most well-regarded, like a high status path. And it was not the right thing for me. Um, and I suffered a lot and actually ended up going back to school to actually figure out a plan for the next part of my career. So already by the time I got to my MBA, I was like, okay, well, I can try to be the smartest guy, but also I was looking around during the MBA and I was clearly not the smartest guy. So I knew that was not my edge. It became sort of more clear at that point that um, but I, I was willing to take more, maybe more risks or I didn't have um, in a way like comp relatively uh, speaking compared to maybe other folks uh, around me. So that, that's an element I figured, okay, um, I'm not going to win with my brains. Maybe I just need to um, try to take chances, right, mm -hmm. where other people wouldn't. So uh, that's one part. And then the second part really was more the fact that I felt like I never fit it in. Like I never really, uh, like I said, my career was not like a, a path of like a linear path. It was more like jumping around, not doing very well an employee. Um, I was not a great employee at Amazon. I'm happy to say it now, but I, I almost got uh, a, 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 like a, those PIP things, right? Like mm -hmm. basically I was about to, <laughs> to get, not to get fired, but basically I had to work on, on myself and, Again, I tried very hard, so I felt like I really didn't fit in. It's not like I was not trying. It's just there's part of me that if I either I'm really hyper-focused on one thing and I'll do it really well, or I really don't care and I, I it's, it's, it's not in my – I'm just not able to actually – override my like if i'm not interested in something it's it shows and mm -hmm. i don't know if it's a good thing or not so so basically i ended up kind of stumbling a little bit into a startup world i worked as an employee first and eventually i was like look i don't see any other way to go than really taking it like a bet on me fully and starting my own thing um i felt like that was the only way for me to get my like what I wanted and be like, really like doing what I think I'm really capable of. I was curious to see what, what I could do and, and whether I would fail or not, of course. Um, so that's, that's kind of a big part of it really, but it was not like, Oh, I have this confidence of doing X, Y, Z. The only thing I thought was at this point, I'll find another job, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, like, I think I would, that's one thing we tend to, I, MBAs, uh, especially, you've already had your success. You've got the validation. I think it's a perfect time to screw up, honestly. Like, right, like there's, I think, like, I, I don't know, I've maybe every couple of weeks, isn't it? Someone who pings me a bit younger, they're like, what should I do? And my advice always ends up being, like, what's the worst that's going to happen, right? Like, I think we're all too risk averse mm -hmm. in a sense because, uh, because of maybe, again, how we've, like going back to at least for me again, it was like my conditioning of trying to always look good, get A's everywhere. Once you let go of that, then I think things feel a lot less risky, um, knowing that the worst case was oftentimes just the status quo, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the worst case being your startup fails or whatever, and then you end up. Um, but again, the thing is, even then, uh, I think a failed founder for me is way more employable than someone who's who's brought up at McKinsey just for the fact that they've had to go through <laughs> the challenges of like the the hard part of just like getting hit on the head every day having to pay like you're accountable right mm -hmm. you're paying for your own mistakes with your your own money if you like and that that means a lot over time it compounds in a way in making you a really solid uh, business person um has your attitude towards risk um changed since you started or since you started having a, like a small family of your own yeah it's a good question i mean yes and no uh for me risk is not something that is like to avoid or to to minimize i think i'm i'm really about taking smart risks and i think that thinking of the downside first is is great like for example when we started return magic i didn't raise money i ended up doing consulting to fund me and my co-founder mm -hmm. 
And we were able to, again, fail in obscurity if that's what was going to happen. That's not what happened. But I think when I think about risk in general, I think about just making sure that um, risk reward are really compelling as opposed to completely limiting the risk. Again, that's like the biggest risk is not taking any risks mm -hmm. in life. So I, I fully believe that. Um, in terms of having a kid and a family, um, well, yes and no. I think that uh, it gives me more ambition in the sense that I want to uh, kind of be an example in a way that you shouldn't let anything get in, in your, your, the way of your aspirations if there's something you really want to do. And um, I mean, yes, I'm in a position of like, I make sure I, whatever happens, I can afford to fail for a long time and mm -hmm. like not have to basically run into financial problems. So once that's sorted, then it's sort of like a barbell, right? So I think that's like the, the part where I know no matter what, I'll be okay. It allows me to go and take bigger swings, essentially. And I think that's a really good thing to have, um, which I didn't have the first time. Literally, I, I was I was uh, at the start of Return Magic, had still a bunch of student loans, um, and I was quite uh, on the edge financially. And that was quite quite hard. Like from a, it, it ends up sort of biasing a lot of the decisions you make because your tolerance for failure or um, such as at least at that point where it seemed like I had much less tolerance um, for mm -hmm. if something went wrong. So again, it goes back to affording uh, myself the ability to fail and fail and fail and still come out okay. Um, I guess uh, if you felt um, even if, like say financially, um... <sighs> What's the, what's the term you use? Well, more so under pressure than, than you would do today. Um, did that make you work harder? Um, because you did incubators. I mean, obviously you, you had, um, you raised funding for, mm -hmm. um, for Return Magic, um, as opposed to um, if, if you hadn't had that pressure. Yeah, of course. I think that fail, like fear of failure is, can be a good motivator. It can cripple you as well. So I think there's like, a U curve, you mm -hmm. want to be in the middle. I don't think that, uh, it, like you have to just approach it in a healthy way. And yeah, I think there are good sides to it. Um, so there's, there's definitely that, that element. Um, sorry, I forgot the, the second part of you. I think there was like a second part to your question. Uh, well, you kind of, you know, you, you got it in terms of, uh, okay. making it, right. making, making you work harder because you feel that pressure. Right. And then, um, and because obviously yeah, I think, yeah, sorry for me, I think what has changed, I would say, and again, it goes back to like thinking about more like what is making it. Um, I was not very, uh, at peace when building return magic, it went really fast for us as well. So, um, I was living in a constant state of anxiety hmm. and as a founder also like nothing works. Right. So, and not only that as a CEO, all the problems, uh, come your way. So you get, you, you sort of, after a while, you, you start wearing darker glasses because everything looks like a problem. And I became overly, uh, so my, my bias came a bit, it became a bit too negative and, um, in a sense that like, if I just zoomed out, things were sort of working, but I was constantly like in the thick of it, trying to, uh, trying to basically sort things out. So I think my, The way I approach, probably I want to approach things is less from a place of fear and more from a place of curiosity, enjoyment, love. Now I understand that, again, that's not, that's a different kind of motivation. So I think like ha having a good, healthy sort of tension between motivation that's fear-based versus more like love-based is really key. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's, that's also been, by the way, a big learning the last few years. I don't think I want to put myself back into a, a state of constant stress mm -hmm. and a lot of this was not the certainly like startups are hard yes but i think it was my own self-talk that just made things a lot worse <laughs> so i think that part i can i can definitely work on um for context uh you worked at amazon for i, th I think it's a year and seven months or something like that couple years yeah and then you you left a like, q4 2015 and then early 2016 mm -hmm. you joined 
Does it make sense? Yeah. You joined um, Return Magic on a full-time basis or joined well? You dedicated yourself on it to it full-time because you're a yeah. co-founder. And um, <clears throat> then you officially launched, I guess, in November 2016, right? Uh, from as I remember it, um, we I started working in it in 2015. Like when I say I, it's really my co-founder who was building like prototype so i didn't have a full-time gig from the start we just had the idea started working on it um when i left amazon i did some uh, consulting mm -hmm. and uh during that period we shipped so I, from what i can remember the first few cu few customers were in late 2015 and uh we weren't public then we just kind of had five, 10 customers trying to learn. And then we sort of gradually launched and then we were kind of all out um, public and and really like, the, I guess like the, we exited our beta, if you like, at the end of 2016. Mm -hmm. By that time we had a partnership with Shopify. So we had good traction. Uh, things were really like, we, it felt like we had a real business basically from one year to the next. The first year was really just like, oh, we made an idea, maybe that's, Good, maybe that's dumb. And then um, a year later, we we had real paying customers. Um, so yeah, that's it. And then because of that partnership, we ended up sort of scaling um, side by side with Shopify to a point where I think it became clear we should actually just be building within <laughs> Shopify. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have a return solution. So we were sort of leveraging a bit of their blind spot uh, in a sense because uh, retailers were really struggling with the return experience and we had become the default guys that they would send mm -hmm. uh yeah. to yeah um i think you had over uh, by the time uh, shopify picked you up uh you had over three hundred thousand returns 2500 merchant customers um uh, did your Spot research yeah uh, shopify <laughs> picked you guys uh, even wrote spotify my goodness um shopify picked you guys up in mid 2018 um and uh, tell me about that, like t towards the end of um, the acquisition process, uh, that moment when you realize, holy shit, this this deal is done, as in signature on paper or wh whatever it would yeah. be. Like, what what was that moment like? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. I guess even today, I have sort of mixed feelings. I feel like I never never completely settled. Um, we weren't trying to uh, like in general, I think exiting in three or four years is like, like three years in our case is quite fast. Mm -hmm. We didn't intend to go out and exit. I think that Shopify saw something in us and they, they really uh, came to us saying, um, well, you guys convinced us we need returns natively. So it became a bit of a David versus Goliath situation where it's like, okay, do we want to compete against our partners? Mm -hmm. And that sort of provoked a yeah an evaluation basically like two paths there uh that in itself was probably one of the hardest decisions i've ever made um at least definitely on the professional side because at, we were just turning the corner things were starting to look really good we had our own independence mm -hmm. um we felt proud of what we had uh you know the product that we had out there and the customers that we had but at the same time um we didn't know what the future would look like and we knew that we got along really well with with Shopify and we knew that um, like culturally like we we'd have something there we like I don't think we would have sold to any other company to be honest like mm -hmm. it was a bit like a a really special situation uh, and didn't really have any good frameworks or mental models to think through this I asked around a bunch of people like people told us all kinds of things. You should sell. You shouldn't sell. They're gonna wipe you out. Like, and I, like now, obviously, with hindsight, I think I would do things differently. That's for sure. But um, you know, on the whole, uh, we, yeah, we decided. Like, long story short, to to go ahead. Um, Shopify was really uh, fair and kind in seeing our potential and offering us a you know uh, a life changing offer. Which, again, thinking back, I. You know, I'm I'm glad we we took it because it's one thing to build a successful business, but then to exit, you need someone who wants to buy you. So many things need to come uh, together, and I think that it's easy to underestimate how many factors need to to combine. So that's that. 
when we actually signed, um, well, it was definitely a relief because basically <laughs> the M&A process is, is a bit brutal, I think, for everyone. You agree on paper, which is called an LOI, and then there's a period of due diligence, mm -hmm. which lasts a month, two months, three months, but then nothing good on our side can come out of that period, right? So it's literally like only bad news that can happen from there, meaning the acquirer could just back out mm -hmm. without any explanation. So I was quite stressed and they were like, obviously we were, um, me, my co-founder, and then our devs, like we didn't have any lawyers or anyone, like we work with lawyers, but then on the other side, you have the big corporate dev team, it felt like having a basically bringing a knife to a gunfight. Like we were just like completely overpowered. So I think I was relieved that like, okay, this is over. Cause it was really definitely a, one of the stressful moments in my life. Um, and then joining was crazy. I was like, wow, man, like what just happened? Uh, I, we really like love Shopify. We love leadership. We were really excited about joining. So that's a great element and definitely found people there to be really smart uh, and wanted to make new friends there. Uh, but obviously we lost autonomy, right? We lost, mm -hmm. we weren't, um, in our case, it was clear that we were going to build inside of Shopify. So return magic became, um, didn't be become the main focus of the team. We kept it alive for as long as we needed, but then it, it, it came down to us to kind of integrate overall a, a large company and Shopify is a large public company. So that part was hard in terms of, and I hadn't really understood how much I would struggle with losing that autonomy, that sense of purpose, that sense of direction. Mm -hmm. So on the outside, I felt like, or at least like you would look on the outside and people would think, oh man, this is great, good outcome. But inside, I, I, I really was wondering for, for a year, at least, did we do the right thing? Like really, I felt like really torn inside um, I had moments where I just had to redefine my purpose, my identity. So it was a bit of a dark time as well. And it's strange because like I was again, like it's these feelings just talking about it, they come back up, but like a really high, high and a high, like a big low at the same time. So, uh, it was, it was strange. It was definitely strange. I think over time I worked, uh, through some of these challenges, uh, in a way that, allowed me to be at peace and just take on whatever, um, whatever I thought was, uh, was a good part and then just leave the past behind in terms of what's not helping. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. that took a couple of years to, for things to really kind of, uh, get a bit easier. Um, let's talk a little bit about, um, kind of around the, the, uh, the elephant as in building a company and then selling it or being acquired. Um, you, you had a, actually, you had a company blog, uh, where you talked about Montreal as the best place to start or to build a technology company, right? And, um, on medium, if anybody wants to find that, and actually I'll include wow. a link. Um, you, you really did your research, man. Like these are posts from six, seven years ago. I didn't well, even remember the, I wrote that. The so internet doesn't forget, it. right? Um, <laughs> so having lived in Canada myself for some 16 years, like I've always seen Montreal as kind of the, the best of, 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 of many things as in it's a bit of Europe, it's a bit of North America. It's, it's certainly mm -hmm. a lot of itself, let's say. And then Montreal or Quebec um, also isn't necessarily free of friction or struggle. I mean, they always wanted to kind of do their own thing, yeah. be, be their, their own place versus just some place somewhere in North America. So so what, like, obviously there's also the decision around, hey, let's stay, um, let's go to Montreal or let's stay in Montreal uh, as opposed to let's go where all the text, you know, the, the devs hang out yeah. type of thing, right? So, so what what made you decide this is the best place for us to to raise this first child of ours uh, and to not yeah. just build it but then also to launch it there yeah all things considered i still think montreal is definitely one of the best spots to uh start a, and and build a technology company uh, I can approach this from a couple of different angles, I think, to really explain uh, how I see things. So I don't know, excuse me, if I don't exactly line up with what I said many years ago, but now is my updated take on this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so for those who haven't been to Montreal, I would say that the way I describe Montreal is as if Brooklyn in Paris had a baby. 
I think that's that's a fair <laughs> representation from wow. a, a visual standpoint. Is you it? have a sense of being in France, but also there you have these brown brick three uh, level uh, sort of duplexes and tri yeah. triplexes and Brooklyn and Montreal were built by largely the same real estate developers. So you get a lot of that. So I think, but culturally it's the same. You have a bit more of a French uh, kind of cultural joie de vivre mixed with yeah. hard charging uh, sort of like two weeks off a year type of American mentality. Uh, and so, so I think that's an interesting blend. Uh, and yeah, I think that sets the scene really well for uh, a rich uh, scene, a social scene, a startup scene, because you have all these this diversity in terms of background. Also, Montreal on paper is half French, half English. Um, there's a big uh, Jewish community as well, um, and the Jewish community is very entrepreneurial. So you have these these uh, these communities or these sub communities that um, that coexist generally really well. I wish sometimes it was more of a whole because I feel like we tend to stick to uh, who we know and, and, and uh, people who are more familiar to us. But that diversity and that sort of, um, that, that, that sort of big melting pot is, is really helpful in terms of generating ideas and such. Mm -hmm. So I think that's like the more sensible, like the more cultural aspect of it. And then there's more like the practical reasons. And it's the fact that Montreal's cost of living is relatively lower. Uh, I think it's one of the lowest in North America. At least last time I checked, I know obviously with, co with COVID inflation, that might have changed. But generally speaking, if you go to Toronto, things are as expensive or, or not more than New York. Mm -hmm. um, same with Vancouver. So Montreal has a low cost of living and has a huge government grants program, which help you subsidize up to 75% of the salary of your developers. So that that is uh, that has become basically a hub for many large tech companies, Google, Facebook. They all have an ML team here, a machine learning team. Right. Uh, Ubisoft, big gaming company, they have a huge team here. So there's a big, so there's that element, just like a big pool of technical talent that's been attracted from all abroad coming mm -hmm. into Montreal, especially the last five years, I would say. Definitely at Shopify, that was also what I was seeing. Um, obviously, Shopify's from Ottawa, which is an even smaller city in Canada, like maybe one, two million people. Like, there's so many devs they can they can find. So the, the strategy was to convince people to move from Brazil, from all over the world. And uh, so Google's done that, Facebook's done that. So I think you have that very diverse, very global workforce. Um, and then, yeah, to finish up, I think for me, I mean, in the commerce space and the retail space, um, both on the software side and on the actual retailing side, you have a really strong history in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is, uh, well, Lightspeed uh, is a large uh, public company here in Canada. They do point of sales software. Um, you have Shopify, of course, you have many other of these types uh, that are relating to e-commerce and marketplaces. So there's that domain expertise that's quite uh, interesting. And the history of Montreal, by the way, like fun fact, about 100 years ago in the early 1900s, Montreal and New York were about the same size in per population and the size of the economy. Montreal being the gateway to come to, to North America. It's mm -hmm. basically you follow a long river and then you come here. So Montreal has a, had a huge port. Obviously, now New York's way bigger. But um, what that means is basically there were a lot of clothing manufacturing uh, type of, of uh, factories in, and uh, a bit like Brooklyn, again, you have that industrial sort of vibe to it. But essentially, all this to say, many, many uh, public and private retail companies come from Montreal, Aldo being one, which uh, they're, they're into shoes and all kinds of things. So, so yeah, anyways, all this to say, I think all of these factors all things considered, mm -hmm. for me, I'm like, where else can you find this? Yeah, I could go to Silicon Valley and buy. I'm, you know, I'm still connected. Like we're not that far, so in a way, I think having a foot into a maybe more global hub, like SF or London, and then having a foot in Montreal for me is kind of the best of both worlds. Um, you are, I, I find, a very introspective thinker. Would and I want to say, uh. And I'll, there's a, there's a, one data point. I'll, actually, I mentioned um, last time we met, um, 
in, in Fontainebleau, actually, you, you talked about a, a book that you were reading, uh, The Courage to be Disliked, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah, uh, so one of my favorites. Uh, so mm -hmm. you're a very introspective thinker, and I want to say, um, and, and I don't mean it in a spiteful way, but more in a practical sense, you don't, I, or I, actually it's a question, do you care what other people think? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, well, yes and no. I think that like I'm human and I'm wired to seek validation up to a point like anyone else, right? So I think I would prefer to be liked than not liked uh, in general. Uh, so, so yes, but that said, um, it depends who, okay? So I really truly only care about uh, people that are very close to me in terms of what they think. So my, my immediate family, for example, mm -hmm. my longtime friends, these people are definitely, I mean, I would be sad if they, like, for example, if I upset them, if I do something and they're, they're not happy with it. Um, so that's one thing. Otherwise, I think I've worked a lot on just letting, like, understanding the fact that, like, it's not up to me what people think of me, right? I completely don't control this. And I've spent so much time, like I said, in my 20s, chasing everything, chasing validation to a point where it became a bit of a problem, I think, too. And then reading this book, I love reading, by the way. So like, I think that's, that's uh, maybe my main source of introspection. Just, you know, I, I'm an ideas collector. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and so that, that book really kind of drove the point home for me in, in thinking, well, actually, if I'm coming from a right place, And I aspire to be a good person. I, I generally try to, you know, not do bad things or lie to people or steal or any of that. Like I, I try to be a pos net positive. Then, you know, I will do what's right. And I will, I'm, I'm more at peace with the fact that like uh, not everyone's going to agree and that's fine. And I'll, I'll um, uh, you know, I'll listen. I, I, not to say that I'm completely like ignoring what people think, but I also need, I think it's really healthy to keep um, a distance and remaining aware at all times that we all want to be liked mm -hmm. and it doesn't always serve us. Um, you, you mentioned a couple of things already um, as you reflected on yourself in your 20s, uh, especially in the context of what it means to be successful or what it means to make it. Um, is there anything, or, 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 or I should say, what else would you tell your 25-year-old self that you know better or that you know of today that, that mm. you wish you had known then? Yeah, that is one of those questions, right, where I could, I could go on. So I think I'll... I'll or hey, maybe to make what's, it... what's the gist <laughs> of your book? What's in your book? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, yeah, no, no, I think I think I had something for you. Well, actually, it's in the book too. So if you're curious to uh, read more about it, you know, I'm looking for better readers, by the way. So anyone who's curious to give feedback or anything. Uh, but for me, I think um, understanding how your identity is shaped is really important. What I mean by that is you're not your job. You're mm -hmm. not your last success. And... Um, Actually, like talking about risk, I think one area where I think you should di diversify the hell out of is your identity. Not having everything right on one thing, your title, your profession, mm -hmm. your startup. Um, I think that it's very important to keep that fluid and keep that balance. So now I'm a dad, um, I'm a musician, I'm a coder, uh, I'm a writer, and And I love it. And all of these things are, so any of them, I can, I can totally like let go of any of these identities. Well, except being a father, I would, I wouldn't just drop it, but for the rest, you know, and I, I'm okay, you know, so I don't feel like I need to justify my identity. I don't need to protect it. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important. And at 25 years old, I was just trying to prove my worth without even thinking about how I was building my identity. So that's one thing. I think relating to this is keeping your identity fairly small. And by that, I mean, like, obviously your ego tends to get in the way. I think in general, like, again, assuming you're an MBA type, you're, you're already smart enough. Uh, you're driven enough. Uh, I think that as careers evolve, one of the big defining factors, and at least that's my thesis is uh, ego and, and, um, and, 
basically uh, checking your ego there. So I think keeping your an identity fairly small means um, you won't get offended by too many things. You won't get frustrated by too many things. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if we all have preferences, but if your preferences are not met, it's okay. You know, I think it makes, um, it makes, it makes living life a lot more enjoyable than having this sort of heavy armor, which is your identity, which needs to be sort of protected at all times. So that's what I would tell my 25 year old self. The other thing is, which I think over time required, I, I could have told it to me, but I wouldn't have understood at 25. I had to bang my head, like I said, like fail in obscurity many times, mm -hmm. but man, focus on what is the right thing for you. Forget about the big job, the big salary, the big firm. I did that and it made me miserable. So obviously that's like cliche, but like really f starting with what makes you unique or what makes you special. And when I say you don't have to have a big plan, it's just like, what feels like play for you that feels like work for other people? Mm -hmm. What is the, the thing you could just keep on doing? For example, maybe for you, it's podcasting. You enjoy just having these conversations. That's it. Like it doesn't need to be that complicated um, and follow that and guarantee that if you are long-term enough, you're going to end up in a really great spot. I think that's, that's what I would tell my 25 years old. But again, I wouldn't listen. I would go and still... So anyways, sometimes you just got to live through it. <laughs> Is there anything else actually that you, that you wanted to cover here that we, that we, that we didn't go over any, any, any point that you want to, mm. that you want to share? Well, yeah, I have a question. What, what, what is your quick definition of making it? Like, how do you uh, think yeah. about that? Because it's such, it's two <clears throat> words, but it's also very, very broad, right. And, and how you can think about this. So just maybe to wrap up, uh, I'd love to hear like, your thoughts and maybe i'll share also what i think making it actually means the the the, the tables have turned um <laughs> as, as he's about to wrap up the show um i actually i came across this a few weeks uh, maybe two months ago where i had i had moments i'm gonna say i had i experienced moments where i'd say this this is it And I cannot make these moments better. And it, in a sense, uh, I mean, this is my answer today as opposed to what it was six months ago or what it would be six months ago. And I think making it, aside from, okay, how, how, you know, how, how much do you have in a bank account or what car do you drive or where is your house, the fact that you have a house in It's the first completely place, irrelevant to making it if you ask me. Yeah. <laughs> But for me at this point, and mind you, it actually it kind of culminates in that statement that, uh, that I'm going to make just right now is to to maximize the moments in your life that couldn't be any better. And um, there are there are a few moments and I, I talked my wife through this as in there are moments that I spend with my with my kid um, which are just like even at like two or three a.m. in the morning where I hold hold him and and it it mind you, it hurts getting up but then it's like it's such a perfect moment and you're like yeah like can it go on a little bit longer or even um like walking through the field with like walking walking my dog right and at some point my wife said what where am i in all of this and i'm like okay you you you're at the foundation of all of this this wouldn't be possible without you um mm -hmm. but it's it's really it's those moments where Because we pull out, we pull out the phone and we start like Instagramming or sending it out as part of a feedback mechanism, because we want to elevate a certain moment. As in, hey, I'm putting that out there and let's see what comes back. And I'm not saying everybody does that with everything they put out there, but in many instances, we put ourselves out there to to get to to have somebody else confirm, yes, this is great, this is good, do more of this. But in the end, mm -hmm. the reality is nobody really gives a shit about you. Everybody gives a shit about themselves and everybody is so busy just trying to keep themselves together and get validation from 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 their uh, from their world around them that they don't actually really pay attention to you. So what you need to find are those moments where you say it's actually it's not about sharing, it's not about getting getting likes or getting somebody else to weigh in and say yes, this is mm. this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen or whatever. But it's really it's it's maximizing on those moments where you say this couldn't be any better. It doesn't matter whether I, I would 10x my income or my 
my my wealth or whatever you want to call it or how i got here in in like in a in a shitty little car or something that's made of gold and there goes my camera i maybe i would making it would mean i have a better camera setup um <laughs> but you know that's for season two uh let's come on here. this is this so is that great. that's I'm my there. answer as in yeah. making it to maximize on those moments that you can't that you that, that you couldn't make any better that you couldn't add on and hence mm -hmm. where where you arrive in those moments and you you want less of whatever else is else is out there um yeah this is this yeah. is beautiful i i think this is this is life you know you're, you're talking about being fully in the present as well which i think yeah. is is really all we've got not to sound cliche but you can scheme about the future all you want you can talk about the past like you really have to find a way i think to to have a sense of well-being regardless of everything that's happening in the moment and that's what i understood from what you're saying so yeah that's great. Maybe to, to wrap it up, I'll, I'll, you've taken a very sort of detailed micro view, which again is, is beautiful. If I try to take the macro level view um, is, and so I think these two things can totally live in parallel. Uh, I think for me making it is really, uh, there's this quote, I can't remember who said it, but um, like the purpose of life is to, to kind of find your gift and the meaning of life is sharing it really. Mm -hmm. So I think, to me, that's that's really what making it is, um, regardless of the, the status, the money, the, mm -hmm. whatever is out, external trackers for success, right? And uh, I'm pretty sure that if you follow that and you're really sort of uh, conscientious about kind of pursuing your gift, um, the other only thing you need to worry about is making sure that like you're wealthy, healthy, and happy. Like those three things are sort of like the three stools. Right. As, as again, as cheesy as it may sound, like your health is really, we, we focus so little in our health, on our health until later in life. And we focus on happiness later in life and we focus on wealth first. And I think we have it backwards. So I think for me, making it is making sure that you, you sort of keep those three things in, in, in parallel, you know, in such a way that like, if you were dropped by in a new world, in a new life, 99 times out of 100, you would achieve healthy, wealthy, happy state by basically kind of figuring out what 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 your gift is and sharing mm -hmm. it with, with others. So um, very true. Yeah. Yeah. 